Well, good morning, Pioneer Drive on a holiday weekend. It's good to see you. It's good to have you here uh, in worship this morning. To my left, to your right is a rose. That rose is out uh, for Lincoln Howard Cruz. You heard Taylor, our college minister, on the video earlier, ministry spotlight video. Uh, Tuesday night, we were in a a staff. our, Our ministry staff has a fantasy football league that some of our staff participate in. And we were in a draft up in the cafe uh, that we were doing. And Taylor was telling us, hey, Kristen's in pain. Kristen's in pain. I, I said, Taylor, you need to go, brother. You need to get out of here. And uh, he finally left. And turns out, I guess he got home. Kristen was in the car because we got a text an hour and a half later, not, hey, we're at the hospital, but hey, Lincoln's here. So uh, we, we need to be praying for Taylor uh, in these days. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, we are excited and we uh, rejoice with Taylor and Kristen uh, this morning. We are continuing our RE series. RE means back or again. And today uh, we're launching something new for the first time in your email that you receive uh, every Sunday morning that comes out. It says this Sunday at Pioneer Drive. Uh, each week, hopefully, Lord willing, my schedule cooperating, there will be a discussion guide that's there uh, for you to download and take with you. Uh, some of you have asked for this, maybe to go through with a small group you meet with at work. Uh, maybe you have a, a small group in your neighborhood. Maybe you as a family just want to talk about what we talk about Sunday morning and sermon a little more in depth. And so uh, that discussion guide is going to be sent out each week attached uh, to the worship guide you get in your email. So uh, you can be looking for that and know that that tool is available uh, to you. Uh, This morning, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah as we uh, wrap up our re-series this morning. And I want to start by just saying God has invited us to participate with him in his move to restore the world back to the way God intended all along. You think about uh, the model prayer, the disciples' prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Uh, Your will be done on earth, Jesus says, as it is in heaven. That God wants to accomplish his will here and now. We're excited. My mind went and started to imagine as our quartet was singing, what's that first day in heaven going to be like? And and we know this world is, is not our eternal home here. But God has called out the church uh, to give the world a preview of what heaven is going to be like one day. It's just a tiny glimpse, just a foretaste of what heaven is going to be like. God has called us to join him in his restoration move. That God wants to give Abilene and the big country, our world, a preview of what heaven is going to one day be. Be like. So let's look at a definition before we jump into our text this morning of the word restore. It, it's to bring back or to put into a former or original state. To bring back to or put back into a former or original state. You think about Genesis 1, the Bible begins in a garden. Things are perfect with Adam and Eve, with the Lord, with people, with God. And then sin entered the equation, and we know that, the, the results of that, the, the separation that happened. And, and we know the, the need for Christ's redeeming work on the cross for salvation. And then we also understand when we read the book of Revelation that the Bible is also going to end in a garden around a tree. And so the Bible begins in a garden, it ends in a garden, and God has called us to be a part of that restoration work. And it's God's work, but God has invited us into it. You think about restoration, something that's brought back into its former state. Uh, you think about, many of you probably watch uh, Fixer Upper. Some of you may endure Fixer Upper. I wish I had uh, the skills to be able to do that kind of work. I would save myself a lot of money, and I would save myself a lot of, uh, well, I'd have a lot of opportunity to do some really cool things if I understood, the, if I had the skills of, of Chip and Joanna Gaines. But, but the reality is we all have skills and abilities that God has given us to help us be a part of God's move uh, to restore the world back to the way God intended all along. So let's look at this house, an amazing uh, restoration. We, we see homes that are restored. Uh, we also may see a car that's been restored before and after. Some of you, uh, this, is, this is a hobby of yours, something you enjoy doing, or maybe a piece of furniture uh, that you've restored. We've done some of that in our house. But you think about things that were, are brought back to their former or original state. God has invited us to be a part of doing that. To be a part of giving the big country and the world a preview of what heaven's going to be like. That, that the will of God would be done on earth as it is in heaven. That, that what happens here and now matters. It matters tremendously. 
And we want to be a part of God's restoration movement. The Israelites were in a period of exile. They were out of their homeland. Their homeland had been ransacked. It had been invaded. It had had been taken over. And there were three major building projects or building emphasis that happened as they were coming back out of exile. First, there was the rebuilding of the temple. There was the rebuilding of the city walls. But there was also the rebuilding of the people. And in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was a a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes of Persia. Uh, That meant that Nehemiah would taste the food, he'd taste the wine of the king before uh, the king ate it to make sure it wasn't poisoned. I mean, on one hand, that sounds like a really cool job, right? I mean, you could taste the best of the best, the the finest of the finest. Uh, But if it was poisoned, uh, you got to go first. And, and you were the guinea pig. Uh, thankfully, Nehemiah uh, never was poisoned. The king's food was, wasn't poisoned, at least while Nehemiah was there. And, and, and so Nehemiah was, was able to be in a position uh, to do something about God's restoration work he wanted to do in Israel. He grew concerned about the city of Jerusalem. He ends up asking a fellow Jew about the status. And this was the report. Let's stand as we read verses 3 and 4. They said to me, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and his gates have been burned with fire. Let's look at verse 4. When I heard these things... I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Thank you. You may be seated. So so here is Nehemiah and he hears the problem. He hears the problem. What was the problem? The Jews were in danger. The city was in ruins. They, They had no protection. They had no security. And so when you think about restoration and God inviting us to give the world a preview of what heaven's going to be like, we have to understand that Nehemiah had a burden. He had a burden for his people. He had a burden for the vulnerable community. And he wept and he sat down to cry. He saw a problem and, and Nehemiah was sensitive to the, to the needs of others. He was sensitive to the will and to the work of God. He had a burden. As you think about the world that we live in, What breaks your heart? What's your burden? What do you think about being a part of restoring? It may be a family member or friend that doesn't know Jesus. It may be racial or socioeconomic division. It may be hunger hearing about hungry people. It may be single parent families. It may be orphans. It may be prisoners. It may be the lonely. It may be the abused. But think for a moment about what burdens you. Nehemiah had a deep burden on his heart. What did he do with that? He carried it to God in fasting and prayer. He brought that burden to the Lord Think about the, the many needs of the world, some of which we heard about in, in the prayer Jeff offered for us a few moments ago. It becomes easy when, when the burdens are so high. I don't think we were created to, to carry the, the burdens of the world. That's not in our job description. That's God's. But, but with our, our devices, with news networks, we, we know about all the crisis. And, and it, beca- it can become easy to be cynical a little bit, to experience what we might call, uh, what psychologists might call crisis fatigue. As soon as we hear about one crisis, we got another crisis on top of another crisis on top of uh, another crisis. And so it's easy to become cynical. It's easy to become overwhelmed. It's easy to be uh, calloused. When we think of all that's broken in the world and restoring all that's broken in the world, it just seems like a very fruitless endeavor. On Wednesday night in our prayer study, we were talking about the question that Jesus asked Mary in the garden, why are you crying? And I think some of us have forgotten how to cry. 
Some of us have forgotten how to weep at the brokenness in our world because it does seem overwhelming. It does seem callous. We, we have many and plenty of reasons to be cynical. But Nehemiah had a, a burden on his heart. And he was willing to do something uh, about it. He didn't want to continue uh, to hear about these reports. He wanted to to do something about it. And and so let me ask you again, what what burdens you? And and maybe if there isn't a burden there, or maybe if what comes to mind, we need to ask the Spirit to help us be more sensitive to the needs around us. Maybe we have forgotten how to cry. And maybe we need to weep a little bit. What's God calling you? to be a part of in our community, in our church, in our world. The Lorax by Dr. Seuss, a favorite in our home. Uh, Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. We think, oh, this is for the person next to me. This is for the person behind me. This is for the person watching at home this morning or on the radio, however but, but it's not for me. But, but if there's a burden that God has placed on your heart, he's, he's going to equip you to do something with that burden. It was Frederick Buechner who wrote, the, the place God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. What's a burden that you've been equipped or that God might want to equip you to be a part of meeting? Nehemiah's calling was rebuild the city. If you look at verse 5 of chapter 2, he goes and he says, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. He has a very clear burden ahead of him. He prays about it, but he doesn't stop there. He's willing to to do something about it. And it's bold enough to go to the king, to his boss, and say, Hey, I need to go. I need to, to do something about this. At great risk, I am sure to his reputation. Well, Nehemiah is given approval to go and to rebuild the walls. He obtains all the necessary permissions and promises of supply. And, and one night, in the middle of the night, he goes out and he inspects the, the city wall. And it's as, it's as bad as it's been reported. There, there's plenty of reason for doom and gloom for saying, God couldn't be calling me to this. This, is, this project is too overwhelming. It's, it's too costly. There's too many obstacles in our way. He inspects. Fire had destroyed much of the city, the gates. It was going to be a big job. But Nehemiah had a burden. But you know, when you step out and you have a burden on your heart and you start to follow the Lord, we can expect that... that opposition is going to come. The enemy doesn't like to see progress in in the kingdom. But we can expect that we're going to, and not all opposition and criticism is from the enemy. I'll explain more about that in a minute. But, But what ends up happening is Nehemiah has this burden. He sees the project. He's got this call. He's received the equipping. But then two Ammonite officials start to discourage Nehemiah. Their names, Sanballat and Tobiah. They're opposed. They start threatening Nehemiah, saying, hey, we're going to report you to the king. They, they mock his work. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the, and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they're building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their wall of stones. That may be true of a John Witten construction project, that a fox would break it down. But these were critical threats. These were critical statements. And as Nehemiah was joining in on God's restoration work, he he had to understand that the discouragement was a part of it. And and part of his his role was he was going to have to defeat discouragement. You know, sometimes we see discouragement as God closing doors. Sometimes we see discouragement as God closing doors. But I think we have to be very careful, uh, assuming that because there is pushback, we're doing the wrong thing. Because often we don't face 
pushback because, or opposition because we're doing something wrong. We face opposition because we're doing something right. We often don't face opposition because we're doing something wrong. We face opposition because we're doing something right. And sometimes the opposition comes from outside, from folks like Sanballat and Tobiah, pointing out all the reasons why the plan won't work, (laughs) why the dreams are too high, why the ideals are too ideal and lofty. They're belittling, they're they're mocking the work, they're saying even a fox could jump over it, but, but Nehemiah had to endure that criticism. Criticism is a part of life, and, and there is such a thing as, as constructive criticism, but that doesn't give us license to have a, a critical spirit. But when we join in God's restoration movement, you can expect that you're going to have criticism. You're going to have opposition. You, you know what's easy? You know what's easy is critiquing from the sidelines. That's easy. Anybody can do it. You know what's hard? (laughs) Working inside of something and within something for it to actually change. The the reality is everybody can, can critique, but not everybody has the courage to create. People who have a a burden and, and, and take that courageous step of doing something about it, you know what they end up doing? They're putting something out for critique. And after the thing is done, everybody's wise. We're all fantastic quarterbacks on Monday morning. We know exactly how it should have been done. When we step out to be a part of God's restoration movement, you can better rest assured opposition's going to come. It's going to come. And if your goal is never to be criticized, then you're probably not going to have much worthwhile work. It's going to happen. Opposition is going to happen. Our goal, if our goal is to always be universally liked, universally respected, universally understood, it probably means you can sign up for something that just doesn't matter. You know, arrogant people deny criticism. Insecure people are crushed by criticism, but mature people are refined through criticism. Nehemiah carried on. God provided, and they watched out for this threat of Sanballat and Tobiah. They, they were, there was discouragement from the inside. And again, just because someone has an observation doesn't mean they're always against us. We need to understand that. But, but we'll talk in a minute about there, there are some folks that, that all they want to do is tear down. And that's not the spirit of Christ. In Nehemiah chapter 4, not only was there discouragement from the outside when we join in on God's restoration Work. There's discouragement from the inside. The, the strength of the laborers is giving out. There's, there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. There was just, uh, the, the need was intense. The challenge was, was demanding. And, and so everywhere Nehemiah had turned, I mean, God had put this burden on his heart, and now he's got Sanballat and Tobiah. Hey, I didn't sign up for Sanballat and Tobiah, Lord. And now I've got discouragement from the inside. We've got, we've got a big project. God's laid it on our heart. And now people are getting tired and, and, and people are getting weary. And he's probably thinking, I didn't sign up for that either. I need everybody rowing in the same direction. And that's true. Sometimes we face opposition from the outside. And sometimes the hardest voice is what's in between our two ears. Sometimes that's the hardest voice to overcome, even our internal voices. But look at what Nehemiah does. He says, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Fear is a remarkable tool of the enemy to discourage and to paralyze. And so Nehemiah calls it out directly, do not be afraid of them. He goes on to say, remember the Lord who who is awesome. So he's saying, remember the Lord. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. And and then he says in verse 14, fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. 
Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord and fight for your cause. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. Fight for your cause. Whatever that burden is that God's placed on your heart. Maybe today you feel burdened. Maybe you have a burden. It seems overwhelming. You look at the needs of the world, the challenges all around us. It, it is overwhelming. But, but, but as Christians, we, we are not to have a spirit of fear. A, a spirit of fear does not come from the Lord. We, we have a spirit of power. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells inside of us. There's no reason to fear. that We remember the Lord. We remember his faithfulness in the past. See and look to his faithfulness and presence today. And don't lose sight of the job, of the task that God has called us to do. No matter how hard that task may seem. You know, there's hobby in our world. <laughs> Critiquing. You know, with, with the internet, we've become experts on everything, haven't we? I mean, just think the past, just the past month, we went from being experts on virology and epidemiology to geopolitical affairs on the complete other side of the world. Right? Some of us did at least. We've, we've got no shortage of opinions. We've got no shortage of, of criticisms. Nehemiah would continue. I mean, even after he comes and he, he delivers this, this big speech and says, hey, remember the Lord, fight for your cause, don't be afraid. He gets, he gets more fan mail from San Valid, okay, and he has to address it again. And finally, Nehemiah has to say this. As the criticism mounted, he had to stand up and say, nothing like what you were saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are making it up in, our head, in your head. You see, we live in a world, a culture, where experience and our own personal experience has been elevated by many to the level of absolute truth. If I believe it, then it's true. If it happened, then it's true. We don't have to worry about a process. We don't have to worry about facts. We just... Take our perception and let our perception become reality. And in fact, we'll even say things, perception is reality. And I will tell you, as pastor, I do remind our staff that to many that is the case, and we want to be above reproach. But perception's not reality. Reality is reality. That's what's true. That is what is absolutely true. And, and the truth is, all statements and all perspectives are not equally true. All statements and all perspectives are not equally true. All people, including myself, we are not experts in everything. We're not an expert in everything. We can be wrong. Every single one of us, I'm wrong all the time. But sometimes as, as leaders, as, as Christians, as, as truth tellers, we, we can be compassionate and we can, we can listen and we can try to do the right thing all we want. But, but sometimes when, when we have God has placed a burden on our heart, sometimes we have to do exactly what Nehemiah said here in verse 8. Sometimes we have to say, nothing like what you're saying is happening. You're making it up out of your head. This is not reality. And, and so we can be kind and we can be loving and we can listen, but... But when God's placed a burden on our heart, we've got to be willing to walk that way. He tried to do all kinds of things. And, and finally, he had to say in verse 3, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. I'm carrying on a great project, I cannot go down. Sometimes we just have to call it for what it is. We have to be confident and bold in who God made us to be. We will never make 100% of the folks happy. And so we just have to keep moving on, and we have to keep doing what God's placed on our heart to do, the burden that he's called us to carry out, and trust that the words that have been spoken to us will be sufficient to accomplish the good work that he's called us to do. He had, Nehemiah had massive challenges. He fought bad business practices. There were unethical dealings, unjust dealings going on as People were having a hard time getting land, and some of the poor were having a hard time getting food. He had to be willing in the midst of, of his leadership to, to deal with that crisis as well. But you see, what Nehemiah did is he built for the vision. 
He built for the vision that God had called him to. In, in, in chapter 3, verse 28, it, it says, above the horse gate, you know, how, how are they going to rebuild these, this, this massive wall? How are they going to do it? Well, chapter 3, verse 28 gives us a clue. Above the horse gate, the priests made repairs. Where did they do it? Each in front of his own house. Each in front of his own house. You see, there was a, a place, a role for everyone to play. Everybody got to participate. Everybody got to be a part. They just needed to do what was in front of their home. Just do what's in front of your home. And they were able to accomplish this vision in 52 days by everybody doing their part. Each priest made a repair in front of their own home. You want to be a part of God's restoration work? You don't have to do it all. Pioneer Drive doesn't have to do it all. But we do have to do something. And we all have something, metaphorically, that's right outside of our home, that's right in front of us every single day, that God has put there for a reason, for, for you to be able to play a role and to, to be a part and to do your job. You see, this job would have been overwhelming for, for one person or for one group. But when everyone participated, when everyone played their part, the mission was able to be accomplished in remarkable fashion. As you look at all that has to be done in the world and all there is to be done in the church or the challenges in your family, it's overwhelming. And the good news is, you don't have to do it all. And the good news is, God's equipped you. God's equipped you for the work that he wants to do in your life. The burden, what's right in front of you, he's equipped you to do. You know, I'm amazed, our, our church builders, when, when I've been with our church builders before, and, and Monday morning you go out and, and you put up the, the big wall Monday morning. And I mean, we get there at... 7 a.m. And, and by 7.45, 8 a.m., the first wall has been raised. And it happens because everybody does their part. We're able to all lift that wall because everybody does their part. And the same is true in our world. The same is true in the church. Everybody does their part. Everybody contributes. You, you hold your section. And, and when you're holding your section and the person next to you is holding their section and all the way down the line, that burden becomes a whole lot lighter. And that's what God calls us to do. And you may say, well, well, John, Pastor John, I'm, I'm not Nehemiah. I don't have that kind of influence. I, I, don't, I don't have that kind of skill. I maybe don't even have that particular burden. You, you may say, I, you know, I'm not the pastor of Pioneer Driver. I'm not, my, I'm not my Sunday school teacher. I'm just not able to do that or I can't do that or that's just not who I am. I can't go on a mission trip. Love the idea, love that we do them. I just can't go. But you know, everybody, everybody can pray. Everybody can pray. Everybody can give. Everybody can love the, the person who's standing in front of them in the name of Jesus. Some of us, our part may be taking care of a parent. Others of us, our part may be taking care of a special needs child. Others of us, it may be, uh, this is my burden, is, is to go and, and minister to the prisoners. Others may be, I, I've, I've got a burden to, to minister to the orphan. To some of them, I've got a, a burden to minister to those who are experiencing crisis. But, but we can all reach out to a neighbor. We can all give a cup of cold water. We can all be an encourager. We can all share the gospel of Jesus. There's so much we can do, even if you say, well, I can't go on a mission trip, or I can't always go volunteer at this or that opportunity, or I can't teach Sunday school, or I'm not able to work with children anymore. Everybody can do something. Edward Everett Hale writes, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. What can you do? You know, as we think about Labor Day weekend, and Jeff asked what our first job was, I was remi reminded of my first job, which was mowing my neighbor's yard across the street. That was my first job, and it was paid $15 every time I mowed the yard. 
And then my first job where I was actually getting a, a, a consistent paycheck was working the, the concession stand at the high school football games. Did it all through college. Nachos, I can make great nachos. Popcorn, great popcorn. Selling hot dogs. That was my job. So you think about Labor Day weekend and, and the role we play. We, some of us may say, well, you know, I'm retired. But, but you know, you have neighbors. <laughs> you, you still go to activities and, and events. Uh, you can volunteer. We, we can be, God wants to use our whole week. We gather as the, as the, as the church on Sunday morning to, to worship corporately, but God wants to use our entire week to minister to other people. And so you can start thinking through, how, how can God use my week? What can I do Sunday to Sunday to minister in the name of Jesus? We can all share the gospel we can all share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people in our world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We can all share the gospel, the good news of Christ Jesus to people who are hopeless, to people who are broken, to people who are burned out. We can share the good news, as Paul says in Corinthians, that God is no longer holding our sin against us. That's something we can do Sunday through Sunday. All of us can be a part of sharing the good news of God's love that's been revealed in Jesus Christ. But one of the things we also say here at Pioneer Drive, I could probably say it more often, is that everybody's a minister. All 2,000 members of Pioneer Drive Baptist Church, we're all ministers. How's that for the size of a church staff? 2,000. We're all ministers, every single one of us. And, And we have to understand we are commissioned for the week. We're commissioned for Sunday through Sunday. That's the place where we spend most of our time, isn't it? especially in the workplace where we can serve the common good because the workplace will give us incalculable opportunities, the work week, incalculable opportunities to share the gospel, whether our work is as a teacher, a lawyer, police officer, accountant, stay-at-home parent. It's all an opportunity for spiritual formation. The average American will spend over 100,000 hours at the workplace. God wants to use that time. God doesn't want to waste that time in in your work life, in your retired life. God doesn't want to waste that that time. You know, Jesus, he didn't spend all his life as some detached spiritualist. He was a carpenter working with his hands. And so we need to understand the, the importance of that good work that we can be doing not just Sunday morning, not just that Pioneer Drive Sunday, does Sunday morning, but that we can do as a church and that we can do as believers. Whether we're at work, whether we're at home, whether we're in our community doing recreation, whether we're retired and volunteering, we can, God can use that, all of that. And, and I think we need to have a, a better understanding uh, that that is good work too. That, that those aren't just jobs to pay the bills. But those are opportunities that we have each and every day of our week to to join in on God's restoration work. Because our work can be done as an expression of worship to God. Our work can be done as an expression of worship to God. If you're an accountant, count your numbers as if you're doing Jesus' bookkeeping. If you're a salesperson, sell that car as if you're selling it to Christ. If you're a computer programmer, imagine it's Jesus' computer you're working on. If you're a construction manager, imagine that it's Jesus' house that that you're building. If you're a sanitation worker, pick up all the garbage that that fell out of the can. It was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said, "If, if, if it falls to your lot to be a street sweeper, Sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets so well that the host of heaven and earth will have to pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. You know, Nehemiah had a burden on his heart. He paused, he prayed, he listened. He had a bold vision. He got people together. And because everybody did their part, that wall, even amidst opposition, even amidst the naysayers, even amidst the doom and the gloom, that wall was completed in 52 
remarkable days. God received all the glory. God received all the the credit. But it wouldn't be done without the work of God. What burdens you? Think about these questions. What burdens you? What, What breaks your heart? Are you able to cry about the brokenness in our world? How have you, how will you handle negative criticism? How have you, how will you handle negative criticism? I use that word negative because, again, not all criticism, uh, we can be re- refined through criticism. And we are so blessed here at Pioneer Drive. I'm so blessed. This past week uh, marked a year uh, in this role. And, and this church, you're amazing. And you support and you pray and you trust. Um, But I know so many of our leaders, I shared this last week to some degree uh, in our 1030 service because we had the chief of our police department, the superintendent of our schools were both uh, in worship in the 1030 service last week. And uh, there is just so much out there that leaders are having to deal with. And this has been a burden on my heart because my concern is that good people are going to start saying no. Good people are going to start saying, it's not for me. And so we have to understand that the negativity and criticism is a part of it. It can't stop us, but we sure don't want to be a part of spreading it. We sure don't want to be a part of spreading it. And so I think as we have a burden, like you just need to know criticism is going to be a part of it. And the question will be, how will you handle it? What will you do with it? And then what, what do you sense God calling you to do about it? And the, it refers to the burden that's on your heart. And some of you this morning are are just now beginning to explore what that might be in your life. That God may just be waking you up at the end of John's sermon to to see a vision for your family or for your church or for your workplace that that he might want to be doing. And others of you are at that point where you're saying, I just needed that, that, that one more encouragement today. I don't have to do it all. But I can do something, and today's the day when I'm going to commit to doing that something that God has called me to do. God has invited us in to his restoration movement, restoring the world back to the way he intended all along. So what's your part? What's your role to play? Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that you use people like Nehemiah Ordinary people have their jobs, their way of life, the predictability that comes from that comfort. You shake them from their comfort zone. You give them a burden, you give them a calling, you equip them for it, and when all is said and done, you get all the glory. So Lord, I pray for all of us. I pray that our hearts may be receptive to what you want to do or what you want to continue to do through us. Help for us to to maintain the course, the the way that you've called us to uh, to walk. Help help us to love our our critics. But Lord, help us to be able to discern and to to mine the fields for for what we need to listen to, what we need to hold on to, and what we just need to say, I've got a great project to do. I can't stop. So Lord, where there is discouragement that's been sown, where there's opposition that's been sown, where the evil one has come to steal, kill, and destroy in the name of Jesus, we ask for that to be removed. And we ask that among our community, among our church, among our country, among our world, oh God, that you would raise up bold leaders of integrity, of vision, with values, uh, to do the right thing and to honor you in all that is said and done. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.